Hallelujah. And glory to God. We thought you'd like to see a part of our Indian family. And you're absolutely right. You know, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Well, we can't go into all the world and preach the gospel, but with the modern technology of today, we can bring people here and let them overdub our videotapes and then send those videotapes back and we can preach the gospel in their own country. Standing in front of me is are the three people uh, who did the uh, Hindi language for us. This is Hildy, and I want you to say, would you please say for me, say hallelujah, so they'll know what my voice is going to sound like over there. And then say, go into all the world and preach the gospel in your native language. Would you do that? Hallelujah. Sari dunya mein ja ke su samachar pragat karo. Isn't that really wonderful? You didn't know I was so clever. I should have ducked behind her when she said that, then you would have thought it was me. And over here is, this one is Charles Boyce and uh, John, and then, believe it or not, Praise all God. of you have seen Dr. Leroy on uh, videotape, and you all thought he was older than this, but this is Dr. Leroy in the Indian, uh, or in the Hindi, Hindi a language. And then standing over here by Charles, we have the people who did the, uh, the overdubbing in the Tamil language. And so when you hear us in the Tamil language, this is what this we'll sound color. like. Now watch out, I'm going to hide behind you. So I want you to know that this is what you'll hear in the Tamil language. Hallelujah. Say, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. <laughs> in, in Tamil. How, you didn't know I could do so well, did you? All right, well, these two are the ones that play, that do the part of Charles and Francis Hunter, and how grateful we are that God is putting people in our path who can take this message all over the world, because that's exactly what's happening to it. It is going all over the world. Well, as you go back to your native land, land we wish you well, and we just ask God's greatest blessings Amen. upon you. Hallelujah. Uh, and if you can just realize, just this one little scene is multiplied all over the world until we're uh, we're approaching 80% of the world on the time that they tried to build their way up to God and try to get to heaven well, by building a tower, a man-made idea of getting to heaven. Uh, God separated the language and set confusion upon the earth. And now here in just a short time, about a year's time, uh, representatives such as you're seeing and John and Tara here uh, in the Tamil language, just in India alone, uh, we'll be speaking in the native language of some 800 million people. That's a huge chunk of the earth. In the Chinese language, about 1.4 billion people. In Mandarin and Cantonese, uh, Pakistani language, some uh, uh, 40 million people, I believe, and that's the Urdu language, and it gets into India. And so it just spreads all over, Korean, Japanese, uh, Russian, Albanian, and on and on and on into the other parts of the world. And that's where God is taking now the simple message that's so important to all the world. And I'd like for uh, Nelson to say something so they'll hear what my voice say. Uh, uh, say, Jesus said, go into all the world, and I'm ready. Jesus <laughs> said, go into all the world, and I'm ready. Just like me. Bless you now. We want to just share how easy it is for you to go into the world and for you to heal the sick. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I'll tell you, this has been a lot of fun because, you know, as I'm standing here with my Bible in front, in front of me, open to the 16th chapter of Mark, which I read at practically every service we have. And I want to read it for you again because I think maybe uh, having these people from India here from two different sections of India will really make this come alive in your life more than it ever has before. Jesus said in the 16th chapter of Mark, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow them that believe. You know, I get so excited when I realize that Jesus said these signs will follow them that believe. Sign number one, he said, in my name. 
And remember, it's that name that's above every other name. It's at that name that every knee has to bow and every tongue has to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And you know, those are the days that you and I are living in when people are learning that there is power in the name of Jesus. And I have never believed more than I do today in the power that is in that wonderful name. Now, Jesus said, in my name, there would be many things that you would do. He didn't say, I'm going to ask you to do this. He said, if you're a believer, you would. He said, those who believe will have signs and wonders following them. Sign number one, he said, in my name, they will cast out devils. You know, that's a sign of a believer. When you see somebody casting out a devil, that's a sign of a believer because he said believers all would cast out devils. He didn't just say a part. He said all would cast out devils. And then sign number two is something that I'm so grateful that I learned is a sign and a wonder. Jesus said signs and wonders would follow the believer. Sign number two is they will speak with new tongues, the baptism with the Holy Spirit. You know, I thought for years that the baptism with the Holy Spirit was a subject of controversy that everybody argued about. We either believed you spoke in tongues or we, did, we believed it was of the devil. And I'm sure you can tell which side I used to be on because I thought the tongues were bad. I thought those Pentecostal people were just terrible. And then I discovered that Jesus said, no, tongues is not a subject of controversy. Tongues is a sign and a wonder that every believer will have. When you speak in tongues, it is a sign and a wonder to the entire world. And he said every believer will speak with new tongues. Now, of course, unbelievers won't, but every believer will. And then he said, and this is all in his name, he said, you will speak with new tongues. He said that in his name, they shall, uh, they shall take up serpents and if they drink anything deadly, it's not going to harm them. And you know, I think if you've heard me before, and I know you have or you wouldn't be at this part, you will know that Jesus did not mean for us to go out and pick up snakes and rattlesnakes and things like that. But you have to remember that he said, all power, all power, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. And then he said, behold, I give it to you. I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And do you notice what he said? Over all the power of the enemy. And he said, nothing shall by any means harm you. Nothing. You see, first he said, it's given to me. And then the secret of the Christian world is giving away. So he said, now I give it to you. He said, it's given to me. I have freely received it, so I give it to you. And now, beloved, can I tell you something? You have freely received, so it's up to you to freely give it away as well. So he said, all power is given to me. Now I give it to you. But he didn't give us that power to sit on. He gave us that power to use. Wherever we go, there is power in the name of Jesus. And he said, you can pick up that old devil, uh, the, that old serpent, the devil, and you've got more power than he has. And then he said, if you drink anything deadly, it's not going to harm you. Now, again, that doesn't mean to go out and drink some filthy, polluted water. But, beloved, I believe with my heart and soul, if when you're out there on the mission field, you're doing what God's telling you to do, it doesn't make any difference what you drink. You're, if you don't have perfect water to drink, you can drink anything deadly and it's not going to hurt you. That's what the Word of God says. And Charles and I are certainly living proof of that, having been over in the South Pacific a few years ago. But the 11 words that Jesus said, the last words that he ever said, are the ones that so totally turn me on because of what I see happening around the world today. Jesus said, every believer, everyone, and that means Y-O-U. He said, every believer will lay hands upon the sick and they shall recover. That's a sign and a wonder that's going to follow every believer. And you know, the people that you just saw from India here, 
They're taking these videotapes back to India. They're going to teach the people over there exactly what we taught you in the first series of videotapes. And you know what's going to happen over there? The same miracles are going to happen over there as happened when you took that training and you learned how to heal the sick. Because, beloved, this is God's message for the hour. This, without a doubt, is God's message for the hour. And there is no church. There's no denomination. There is no pastor. There is no group. There is no person who's going to stop what God is doing today. And you know, Jesus said, these signs and wonders and miracles will follow the believer. Now, I just want to share something with you because I want to show you, my, you might say, well, now, how can that possibly work if they're overdubbing your voice and they're taking your face and their voice back to India? Does it really work? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. It works wherever we go. Because I want to share something with you that happened to us down in Brazil. Now, we had our tapes lip synced into the Brazilian, into the Portuguese language, which is the language of Brazil. Now, there we were, same face, but we're speaking Portuguese, and I don't know a single solitary word of Portuguese. But you see, when you have an anointed person do them, the same anointing that flows through you will flow through them, and the same effect will be had on the people who listen thousands of miles away. Well, we sent our videotapes and our book uh, down to Brazil in their own language, and this is the interesting thing. We had never been on the radio down there. We had never had a television program down there. Uh, we had never had our books or our videotapes down there until just about one month before we went to Brazil. And so when we went down there, we really didn't know what to expect. I mean, you know, you think, wow, God, are we going to have 1,000? Or should we be thankful for 500? Or should we be thankful for 200? You know, you never know when you go into a foreign country how have they received your particular type of teaching on uh, video? Are they going to think these are Americans are way off the wall? Or what are they going to think? Well, we discovered the answer to that when we got down to our first heating explosion in Brazil, which was in the northern part of the Amazon River, in a town called Belém. And when we went there the first night, I'm not kidding, we really went with fear and trepidation because we were thinking, how many God are going to be here? And finally, uh, Charles and I decided we were going to think real big. And so we said, God, how about 5,000? And then I said, you know, God, if you really want to give us a double portion, give us 10,000. And I thought that was thinking above and beyond anything that I was capable of, remembering, of course, that we're not world famous like a lot of people are, and yet somehow or another God's Holy Spirit has a way, a remarkable way of doing things. So we got to our first healing explosion could hardly believe what we saw. When we walked in, every seat in the stadium was filled. Then they come to us with the exciting news that there are 35,000 people locked outside the gates. I said, you've got to be kidding. I never saw 35,000 in the United States. And I said, we certainly didn't come to Brazil to lock people out. So I said, open the gates and let them in. They said, well, we put them. There's no more seats left. Who cares about a seat? I mean, when God is moving and God wants to change a nation, let's don't be tacky and worry about seats. So I said, bring them in and let them stand on the soccer field. Well, I'll tell you, they jammed that soccer field from wall to wall. I never saw people that looked so much like sardines in all my life. They were all just pressed together, jammed in so tight that it didn't look like there was there was just absolutely no way that you could move to, to even do anything in the crowd. And from wall to wall in the stadium, so... Um, I'm not really real sure what I said, but I, I probably just said a few things like God is here and God's healing power is here and God wants to heal you. And, and then we decided, it just seemed like the Spirit of God was saying, go ahead, minister salvation and minister the baptism with the Holy Spirit first of all, because I know it's a lot easier for people to get healed once they get saved, once they get the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Now, there was no way we could bring them forward because... They were as forward as they could get. They were, the whole field was just filled out. So I just had everybody in the stadium pray a sinner's prayer. And then having read to them from the Portuguese Bible what I just read to you, I said, now you remember Jesus said 
that every believer without exception would speak with new tongues. And I said, remember, that's a sign of wonder. I said, it's not a subject of controversy. And as I always say, if you think it is, if you, because you say, well, my church doesn't believe it. I always say tough, God does, because he's the one that invented tongues. So I said, how many of you do not speak in other tongues? By this time, we had somewhere between 50 and 60,000 people in the stadium. And so I said, how many of you do not speak in tongues? I could hardly believe my eyes as I looked all over the place because at least 80% of the hands were raised. They did not speak with other tongues, I thought. Surely they didn't understand what I said. So I had the interpreter repeat it, and he repeated it, and again the same hands went up. So I said, how many of you would like to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speak in other tongues? Again, another 80% raised their hand, which meant a minimum of 40,000 people saying, I want to receive the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Well, Charles began to minister the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and when he gets to a certain point in it, he always says, one, two, three, now. And he's, as he says that, he tells everybody begin, to begin to speak in a new language, not in any language that they know. Now, this is a real interesting thing. You know, I really hate to say this, but in the United States, when you minister the baptism with the Holy Spirit, uh, and this is the way people usually start out. I don't care if you say, pray loudly. They'll all go like this. They'll say, And then they just disappear into nothing. And um, if you can get them to pray for 60 seconds in tongues, you're really doing real good. Most of the time when they start, it'll, the, they just let the devil come in, you know, and, and they let the devil talk to them, and the devil will say, that, well, that's your voice, and you're just making silly little sounds and things like this. But you know, I had stood there, and I said to those people, when you begin to speak in tongues, when you begin to speak in tongues other than your native language or any other than any language that you know, that is the same power of God that's coming into you. That's the same resurrection power that brought the Lord Jesus Christ out of the grave. This isn't just a silly little thing where you go, and then that's the end of it. This is the power of God, that resurrection power that brought Jesus Christ out of the grave. And you know what? I'm so glad. I'm so glad that they believed me when I said that. Because you see, they began to think, if I begin to speak in other tongues, I'm going to have within me that same power that raised the Lord Jesus Christ out of the grave. And they got excited. And so when Charles, when we got the point where Charles said, one, two, three, now, I never heard anything so loud in my entire life. Instead of this little, you know what they meant? They were going, I'm Delamacoramaca. I never heard anybody pray so loud in tongues in my life. Now remember, this isn't just a little group of 100 up here. It's not the 40,000 who said they wanted to receive. It's the 40,000 plus the 20,000. So you have 60,000 people praying in tongues at one time. Do you have any idea of the volume that is created? I tell you, there was, it was just like a, a clap of thunder when they all began to pray in tongues at one time because it was so loud. I really thought that there was thunder and lightning someplace or another. And then I discovered it was just the power of God's Holy Spirit. And you know what? They didn't stop. They didn't stop after a one big loud burst. They just kept on and they kept on and they kept on. And I looked at Charles and I said, honey, we just lost it. He says, I know. What do you think we lost? We lost the whole service. And I knew it. I knew it instantly that there was no way that we would ever get the service back. So I have to be honest with you, I didn't know what to do. And so I looked at Charles, I said, if you can't beat them, join them. And so the two of us raised our hands, and I mean, we just began praying in tongues as loudly as we could. Well, we prayed for quite a while, and they didn't show any signs of slowing down, you know. And I thought, what do we do now? And so we just kept on praying, and, and so all of a sudden, I thought, well, I'll just raise my hand, you know, like this, and, and I'll, they'll know that I mean, be quiet. You know what they thought? They thought I was waving at them. So they just waved back at me. And they think when they're waving back at me that that means that they're supposed to pray louder. So they continued to pray louder and louder and louder. 
So Charles and I, we can do anything about it. So we just waved back at him and we just prayed louder and louder and louder. And all the time I'm thinking, God, what are we going to do now? And it was just like God said, you don't have to do anything. I'll take care of the whole thing. And take care of it is exactly what he did, beloved. Because while all this loud praying in tongues was going on, all of a sudden we heard a scream way over on this side. There came an empty wheelchair. The people were all jammed so tightly together that there was no way they could move. So the supernatural and the uh, power had done a sovereign act over on that side of the stadium. And someone had been healed. And as a sign of their healing, they passed up the empty wheelchair over the top of the crowd. That turned me on. I don't know about you, but that turns me on. And so all of a sudden I looked out there. And you know what? There was an empty stretcher. An empty stretcher was coming. And then came another wheelchair. Then came another wheelchair. Then a stretcher. And then pretty soon they began sending up cr uh, crutches and braces and walking sticks. And then another wheelchair. I have never seen nor have I ever felt the power of God like I did standing there in that open air soccer field in Belém, Brazil. The first time we'd ever been to Brazil, but God's spirit is moving all over the world. Well, we stood there just all rejoicing. I mean, I never, I have to be real honest with you, I never saw anything so confusing in my whole life. I mean, all these people are, are, they're still speaking in tongues and everybody's hollering and everybody's yelling. And of course, we can't understand anything that they're saying. And all of a sudden, Charles and I were totally deserted. Everybody ran over to the side of the stage and they were all ecstatic and they were all yelling and carrying on and finally we got a hold of an interpreter to come and tell us exactly what all the excitement was about and all they said was look at the orange shirt and then in English I heard my son-in-law's voice say look at the orange shirt so somebody must have told him what to do well I thought momentarily is that like um, you know expressions we have up here about waving the red, red flag I thought maybe an orange shirt had something to do with that but as I turned to look way at that part of the, at that side of the uh, soccer field I saw a man in an orange shirt and he was running and he was running just as fast as he could possibly run and then pretty soon there were maybe like 50 people started running and the only place that you could run was immediately next to the stadium wall there was maybe a little place in there of five or six feet where there would be enough room for somebody to run and so he began running 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 and all of a sudden he began to be joined by all these other people and such commotion you never heard in your entire life there was such rejoicing it was just absolutely just absolutely tremendous but we all kept watching because we knew there had to be something special about this so we watched him all the way around and when he got around close enough he came up on the stage and he hugged Charles and then he hugged me and he said I'm not even saved and God healed me he was so surprised that God would look down on a sinner and in his love and his grace and his mercy that God would heal him. Well, of course, you see, I knew that God healed sinners because Jesus said, if you don't believe me because of the words I say, then believe me because of the miracles that you see me do. And so, you see, I knew that God did that. But when I heard what was the problem with the boy, that really turned me on. He had been in an automobile accident he had severed his spinal cord. And of course, as you well know, that makes you a paralytic. And so he was sitting over in the chair, totally paralyzed in his wheelchair from the waist down. And when all this wild praying in tongues was going on, the power of God sovereignly came right down there and gave him a brand new spine. A brand new spine. You see why I believe today that there is power in the name of Jesus? Because throughout, that, throughout this whole time while they're praying in tongues, and we're praying in tongues, I'm saying there's healing in the name of Jesus. Jesus wants to heal you. And I'm repeating this over and over again. Every time you say the name of Jesus, there is power that goes out. Not only that, I want to tell you something else too. Do you realize that when you have 60,000 believers standing there together and in the stands, 
Each one of them has a force field of power that goes out. So can you imagine 60,000 force fields of power in one soccer field all going out to touch people and to heal and to save and to baptize with the Holy Spirit and to deliver them from demons? You know, they, they brought several children up on the stage, and the children were screaming at the top of their lungs. I mean, screaming at the top of their lungs. And I said to somebody, why are they screaming so? And then they told me a very interesting story. These were deaf mutes. Can you imagine being deaf all your life, I'd say the kids were maybe eight, nine, ten years old, somewhere in that bracket. Can you imagine being deaf all of your life and all of a sudden the first sound that you ever hear is 60,000 people praying loudly in tongues? Do you can you imagine the impact that, that that had on those children? But they were totally healed by the power of God. I understand that night that there were dozens of deaf children who were totally healed while we were all praying in tongues. Now, you know, God may never call you to a foreign soil, but then again, he may. You may think, oh, well, I'm not an evangelist like you are. Well, 22 years ago, I wasn't an evangelist either. I was the wildest sinner that you ever met in your whole life. And you know, I somehow or another couldn't, couldn't help but feel as I stood there that great night. Oh, what a beautiful night it was. The moon was out, just a full moon. It was just gorgeous. And I stood there and I was so thankful to God. I said, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you brought me up out of sin and bondage. And yet you can use me. 49 years a wild sinner, and yet God chose to use me in such an exciting way. And if God will do that for me, God will do that for you. You see, maybe your ministry will never be overseas, but then maybe it will. Maybe God will send you over to India where these people today came from. Maybe over there you'll have 200,000, a lot more than I did. Because you see, God doesn't care who you are as long as you are available. You know, his ability is limited only by your availability. What he wants to do in the world is limited not by his power, but your willingness to go and to do and to believe that you can, that you can use the name of Jesus and that miracles will happen. Well, you know, well, I can guarantee you that when we left there, we were... On the moon, I started to say, I don't even know where we were. I think we were out in outer space someplace or another. All of us who went, and I guess there were 13 of us that went along, we were so excited because we had seen a move of God like we had never seen in all of our life. But I want to tell you this. After Charles and Francis left the arena, the miracles didn't stop. They took us out knowing that as long as we stayed there, the people would look to us as individuals for healing. But we told them that the healing dreams had been trained down there through a video. And so the anointing of God was on them. And after we left, children with cerebral palsy were healed. The lame walked. People got out of wheelchairs. And uh, one of the most exciting stories that I heard back was that a child was brought that had an open skull. And when two little ordinary believers, just like you, laid hands on them, that child's skull instantly closed up. They had told the parents that he would probably be retarded all of his life, his life because of that open skull. And yet you see, God chose to use a believer to do a miracle. Hundreds and thousands of miracles went on after we left the stadium because God is using the ordinary believer today in ways that they never dreamed was possible. Well, as you can imagine, we went on from there and we just had all kinds of, of uh, I don't really know what was in our hearts. I guess we were thinking, well, now, God, would you ever do that again as we went on to the second city? And I'll give you the name just because I know how to pronounce it and I didn't before then. But we went to a town called Goianias, which is in sort of the central part of uh, the great nation of Brazil. And we really wondered, would God do it again? I mean, would we have another crowd? Would they be as excited? Would the same miracles happen? And I believe what happened there 
is the thing that convinced me of the power that's in the name of Jesus more than anything that I've ever done before. Because once again, as we minister the baptism with the Holy Spirit, we saw over 80% of the people hungry for the power of God in their life. And once again, Charles ministered, and as we ministered and they began to speak in tongues, we saw the supernatural power of God again begin to move. Because this is what God is doing all over the world today, because I believe with my heart and soul that we are living in the very end times. And so once again, we saw these wheelchairs come over the top and the, and the empty crutches and the empty canes and the walking sticks and the, the stretchers. And for some reason or another, I have no idea why I did this. And I think if I had known what was going to happen, I probably wouldn't have done it at all. But I was just impressed of the Holy Spirit because I had seen so many demon-possessed people there. You know, in a, in a land where there's a lot of witchcraft uh, and there's a lot of evil spirits and ancestral curses coming down the line, uh, it's hard to believe. But when you see these bodies that are all warped and racked with pain and, and so hopelessly crippled, you know that this is strictly the work of the devil. So because I believe in the power that's in the name of Jesus, I got up and I said very enthusiastically, now devil, I bind you right now by the Spirit of the living God in the name of Jesus. You foul, tormenting spirits, I command you to come out right now in Jesus' name. Well, I thought that was a pretty good statement to make because the Bible says that there is power in the name of Jesus. You know, sometimes I don't think we realize how much power there is in the name of Jesus. Because these demons began manifesting themselves, and they began coming out, and people said that you just see black clouds just coming up, just coming out of people all over the place. There was tremendous deliverance that night. But then a very interesting thing happened. Way over on that side of the soccer field, we were in a soccer field again, way over that, that side of a soccer field, I heard a scream. And so I looked over there, and I tell you, I saw the most demon-possessed person I've ever seen in my entire life. She looked absolutely wild. Her hair was wild. And, and as far away as I was, you could see that wild look. And even though they were jammed in there, as I've often said, like cans of Vienna sausage. If you've ever eaten a can of Vienna sausage, you know how hard it is to get that little middle Vienna sausage out of there. The people couldn't move because they were so jammed in there so tightly together. But when this demon-possessed woman started down that aisle, you better believe that they started moving because there was a little path that was cut there for her. And I'll tell you why. Because she came down like a whirling dervish. She was just twirling as she came. And as she came, uh, if anybody got in her way, I don't care how big you were, how little you were, you have to remember that demon-possessed people have supernatural strength. So here comes this demon-possessed woman, and she really wasn't very big, and she gets a hold of this one man, and she goes, Poo! and just throws him over there. And, and then she twirls around another way, and there's another one. So she picks him up, and she goes, Poo! and she throws him over there. Well, I thought we got to get this situation under control, so I said as loudly as I could, or as loudly as I thought was necessary, I said, devil, I bind you in the name of Jesus. Now you foul, tormenting spirit, come out of her in Jesus' name. And you know what? That didn't phase that devil a bit. Because about 20 feet closer, I looked and I thought, wow, that's, nothing happened to that devil. I better say that again. So I thought maybe that little devil was hard of hearing. I'd have to say it a little louder. So I said a little louder, devil, I bind you right now. In the name of Jesus and by the power of God, you foul, stinking spirit, come out of her in the name of Jesus. Well, you know that devil still kept coming. Would you believe that? Here I had used the name of Jesus. Now, this was three times. First time generally, the second two times individually, and that devil is coming. About 30 feet closer, I thought, well, I better say something again. So once again, I repeated those words and that name that's above every name. And I said, now, devil... I bind you in the name of Jesus. I thought I'd talk a little slower because maybe the devil talked Portuguese. He didn't understand my English. So I said, devil, I bind you in the name of Jesus and by the power of God's Holy Spirit. Now you foul, stinking devil, come out of her in the name of Jesus. 
You know what? That didn't phase that devil at all. I repeated this several times until all of a sudden the woman is probably 30 feet away. By this time, the situation is getting tense. They, we were on an eight-foot stage, and they pulled the stairs up on the stage so that demon-possessed woman couldn't get up there. And I guarantee you this, by this point, everybody is on the back of the stage except my husband and me. So I look over at this one. I thought, I better be a little more emphatic with this because we're not getting across. We're not getting the message there. So I repeat it again, very energetically and very enthusiastically and very loudly. You foul, stinking devil in the name of Jesus. And I think I repeat the name Jesus another time so I'd be sure that I'd be sure they'd hear it. In the name of Jesus, you come out right now in Jesus' name. Whoops. Now the devil's 20 feet away. I want to tell you this. That's too close for comfort. <laughs> that's much too close for comfort. So I thought, well, I better really get enthusiastic. So I said, you foul singing devil, come out of her in the name of Jesus. Now she's only 15 feet away. I said it again, and she's only 10 feet away. Now I'm going to stop right here. <laughs> and I want to clarify something. Because I think this is very interesting. There comes a moment in a situation like this. When 5,000 thoughts can come into your head in one split second. Did you know that? 5,000 thoughts can come into your head. Now, here was one of my first ones. Shall I run get behind Charles and let him protect me because the husband is supposed to protect his wife? Shall I run real fast and get behind him? No, I have to be honest. I that thought flickered in my mind, but I didn't let it stay there because when you're standing there as an oracle of God, you better know that the authority that's in that meeting is vested in you at that particular moment. Had I passed the microphone to Charles, we would have lost the whole service. But that little thought flickered in my mind. I wonder if I would have run real fast and get behind Charles and hide behind him. And then a second thought flickered in there, and oh, the devil would have loved for me to believe this one. Because for a split second I thought, the Bible says that the name of Jesus is above every other name. It's not working, God. Now, God, that woman is getting too close. You see, all these thoughts can come into you in just one, the twinkling of an eye. A real fast little thought right there. Then another thought that floated in my mind was a very interesting one. Many, many years ago, I heard Dr. Lester Summerall talk about a woman in the Philippines that was bitten by devils. And everybody else was scared silly. And old Dr. Summerall just walked right in there. And I thought, well, if he can do it, so can I. By this time, the woman is right at my feet. I had stepped over to the edge of the stage. Now, I'm smart enough to know that that woman with that power, that demonized power, could shitty right up that eight-foot wall and could clobber me into a million pieces. Do you run? No. You see, I either believe in the power that's in the name of Jesus, or I better quit preaching. So now this woman is standing directly below me. And in the loudest voice I think I've ever had in my entire life, I said, devil, I bind you right now by the spirit of God in Jesus' name. You foul, stinking devil, shut up! And it was when I said the word shut up, I really yelled it out that time. But something else happened. Way over here, I heard a scream. And for one moment, I looked up. Now, when you're wrestling with the devil, you should never look up. But I looked up, nevertheless, because I heard this scream, and along with that scream came another empty wheelchair. You want to hear the rest of the story? You'll have to come back and watch the next hour. No, no, no. I'm only kidding you, because I will tell you the rest of the story right now. I look back, and the woman's not there. Where'd she go? I couldn't see her any place. And I thought, I wonder what happened to her. Because in just that split second when I, walked, when I looked up after I had said, you demon, shut up, there was no crazy woman standing down there. And I thought, I wonder what happened to her. So when the service was over, I asked two or three people 
And you know, sometimes people who love to wrestle with the devil and who don't believe in the power that's in that name that's above every other name like to tell fancy stories. So I heard, oh, it took 30, uh, 30 uh, pastors to get her off and she was biting and kicking and scratching. And that's the way I went back to the hotel that night. But you know, I laid awake that and all that night and I kept saying, God, that's not what your word says. That's not what your word says. Your word says that the name of Jesus is above every other name. God, surely it worked. It wasn't failure, was it God? Well, we went through the rest of Brazil and we saw all kinds of wild, exciting things happen. But always in the back of my mind was that little thought, what happened that night? What failed that night that the name of Jesus did not get that devil out? Well, we were going to be on the cover of Charisma magazine and Charisma had called me and they said we would like to have a crowd shot of uh, your Brazilian meetings. So they said, would you pick it out? So I said, sure. And I wanted to make sure that I got the right picture in there. So I personally went to where our file of Brazilian pictures was and I took them all out. And so I got to a certain place where there are a lot of crowd shots and I laid one down here. And when I looked, I saw it was a crowd where that demon possessed woman was way in the back. Then I looked at picture number two and now the demon possessed woman is up closer. And then I looked at picture number three, number four, number five. And in each picture, you can trace the path of this demon possessed woman. Now she's over here, five feet away. And then I turned to the next picture. And I could have cried, beloved. I could have wept with all my heart. Because standing right down in front of me, remember I told you I looked up just for that split section, second, but in that picture stands the most beautiful, peaceful woman that you ever saw. I looked back at the other pictures. It's the same woman, the same wild hairdo, the same blouse, the same skirt, but with a peace of God and the love of God on her face as she was looking up at me. Now, you know, here's the funny thing. I shared that story in Dallas right after we came back from Brazil. And the man who did our videotaping came up to me and he said, Francis, I guess I never did see you, did I, after that? I said, no. He said, you know what happened? He said, I talked to her afterwards. He said, she was the most beautiful woman that you ever met in your entire life totally set free by the power of God. Do you see why I believe in the power that's in the name of Jesus? If I had not believed as strongly as I do, I would have run as fast as I could have run that day. But I stood my ground and God is faithful. If you will just stand your ground and you will just believe that God is faithful and that the name of Jesus is above every other name. But you know something else I believe the devil knows? I believe the devil knows whether or not you actually believe that. You see, as I stood there unwilling to back down and risking possibly even my life because if that demon possessed woman would have gotten a hold of me, she could have clobbered me in nothing flat. But you see, I stood there unwilling to believe that the devil had more power than there is in the name of Jesus. I hope you'll take that story to heart and that you'll remember whenever you're standing in front of some disease, there is no disease that's as big and as powerful as the name of Jesus. Well, God wants to use you in exactly the same way. You see, Charles and I are no different than you. We're really common, ordinary, everyday, miracle-working people just like you. The only thing that maybe makes a little bit of difference between us and you is the fact that we use that power of God all the time. Wherever we go, wherever we go, we minister healing because Jesus said, if you don't believe me because of the words, I say, the words that come out of my mouth, then believe me because of the miracles that you see me do. 
And you know, a miracle is worth a million words. You know, I want to tell you just one last little story that, that I think will, will show you what a miracle will do. And this is why God has called this hour and this day and this time to be the day of the signs and the wonders. You know, as I often say, I, well, I hear preachers talk every so often, and they'll say, don't follow signs and wonders. And I always say, I don't follow signs and wonders. They follow me. And they should follow every believer because that's what the Word of God says, that signs and wonders and miracles will follow every believer. And I want them to follow you. I want them to just run after you every day the rest of your life. And if you don't think that they have an effect, let me tell you this. We were in Guatemala. And uh, in Guatemala, we, what was very interesting, because we were at a Catholic church on Sunday morning, we were there for the Mass, and then the, the priest said, now I want you all to stay for miracles because we're going to have a healing service today. And you know, that's really something when a Protestant is in a Catholic church with a miracle service. And miracles we saw, and probably one of the greatest miracles we saw, was 90% of the church received the baptism with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues. But you see, that's what God is doing today. God is crossing denominational barriers like we have never seen them crossed in our entire life. It doesn't make any difference what the church is. I want you to remember that God's power is moving in that church. Well, we saw all kinds of signs and wonders and miracles there. Although, as I say, I think the thing that impressed me the most was the fact that 90% of them caught the baptism with the Holy Ghost. But you know, beloved, people are hungry all over the world. I don't care where you go to, whether it's in the United States, whether it's in Russia, whether it's in Poland, whether it's in China, whether it's in Tokyo, whether it's in Brazil. People are hungry, hungry, hungry for the power of God. They're fed up with a dead religion, and they want to see a living Jesus and a Jesus that's full of power. Well, that same night that we had spoken to the Catholic Church in the morning, we spoke to the Assembly of God Church in the evening. Again, I was amazed because they did not minister the baptism with the Holy Ghost. So again, somewhere, well, in this case, I'll say between 80 and 90 percent of the people came forward to receive the baptism with the Holy Ghost. And that was really exciting. But can I tell you why they came forward for that? Because before we ministered that, we decided to show signs and wonders. And we really had prayed. We said, God, would you mind showing off? Would you mind really showing off so that these people can actually see the miracle working power of God? So Charles had a word of knowledge, and we called, a, um, we called for someone who had either a ruptured disc in the lower back or a fractured disc in the lower back or a herniated disc, but we insisted that it had to be somebody in intense pain. Well, the first one they brought up was carried up by two of the ushers. She had been carried into the church, and then she was carried up on the stage. And she had gone to the hospital because she had a ruptured disc. And while she was there, they gave her, what, this is what she said, uh, a dirty needle. Uh, they gave her some kind of injection with a dirty needle, and she got encephalitis. And her, and her fever, because of the encephalitis, went up extremely high, and it left her with considerable other body damage as well. But because of the excruciating pain in her back, and she said, I cannot lay, I cannot stand, I cannot sit, I cannot do anything, they decided that they were going to, to, to operate on her uh, three months later. And so somebody told her about the miracles they had seen at the Catholic Church on Sunday morning. See what miracles do? And so they brought her to the service that night. So she was one that they called up. And so she also said she had this terrible pain in the back of her neck. So what we did, Charles did at what we just call the leg thing. Then he did the pelvic thing, and he commanded a new disc to form in there for that, for that one that was ruptured. And all of a sudden, this woman looked up, and she began to cry. And she's still sitting there, and she said, I don't have a pain 
either in my lower back or in my neck because she said when the fire of God went into my back, it also went into my neck and she began shaking her neck all over the place and she kept saying, it doesn't hurt, it doesn't hurt. Then she got up and she began to bend over and she began to do all sorts of very interesting thing, things and she went away totally healed by the power of God. But that's not the big miracle. The next man that came up didn't tell us who he was. He just simply said that he really wasn't a believer and he just came over to see what we were doing. And he just, when we called out that word of knowledge, he said that was his problem and he wanted to really see if there was anything that could be done. And so Charles sat him down and, and uh, grew out his leg. And the minute the leg grew out, this man jumped up and he said, say, as long as you did that, he said, because that didn't hurt at all. He said, as long as you did that, he said, how about my eyes? He was wearing these real thick, what we call bottle glass glasses, you know, with the, that people wear when they have extremely bad eyesight. Well, that's the kind of glasses that he was wearing. So bless Charles. He's got a lot more courage than I have. He's got a lot more boldness than I have, although most people think that I'm the one that has the real boldness. But I really believe Charles has a lot more than I have. He went like this. He went, licked his two fingers. And then he said, in Jesus' name, I command those little onion skin layers in your eye to begin to flow with, blue, with blood and fluid. And I speak healing to these eyes in Jesus' name. He had stuck his fingers up under the man's glasses, and I had my hands on the top. The man fell out under the power of God. His glasses fell off, and he stood up, and he said, I am a neurosurgeon. He said, you are not a doctor, so you can't diagnose me. But he said, I'm a doctor. I can diagnose myself. And he said, I'm here to tell you, I am totally healed. He said, what I could not do in the medical field, you have done with the supernatural power of God. Well, you know, <laughs> I guess you know what happened. He got saved, got baptized with the Holy Spirit. But here's something else. He got so turned on because of the miracles that he saw happen to somebody else and then happened to him that he came to our training services. Now remember how what he had gone from, from a, a non-believer to a spirit-filled believer and he took the training all day on Monday that we had. He took the training that we had on Tuesday. And on Tuesday night, he was on the healing teams laying hands on the sick. And I think the thing that probably excited him the most was this. He went up to a man in a wheelchair who was totally paralyzed. And he said, I couldn't do a thing with all my medical knowledge. But he said, in the spirit, I can. And so he laid his hands on this man, and he said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give unto thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And the paralytic rose up and walked. I'll let you guess what happened to the doctor. He'll never be the same again and he's spreading the good news all over Guatemala. Remember, God wants to use you that same way. Jesus said, if you don't believe me because of the words. You see, words can sometimes go out there and they can fall on, on soil that's not fertile. But a miracle always falls on fertile ground. Remember that. Go, preach the gospel to every creature. Those who believe and are baptized will be saved, but those who do not believe will be condemned. And then here's that wonderful promise that Jesus made for you. Wherever you are listening to this tape, he said, I promise you, these signs will follow them that believe. Sign number one, in my name they'll cast out devils. And whenever you run across a devil that might frighten you just a little tiny bit, remember that night that I stood on the stage in Brazil and this demon-possessed woman came down. Does the name of Jesus work? Is the name of Jesus above every other name? Yes, it is. 
I stand here more convinced than I have ever been in my entire life that the name of Jesus has great power in it. So when you cast out devils, remember those who believe shall use my name. Don't try it any other way. And then he said those who believe will, will not only cast out devils, he said they will speak with new tongues. And beloved, I believe that we're living in the day and time when God wants us to speak with tongues more than we ever have in our entire life. Don't just wait till you go to church on Sunday. Every time a situation comes, every time, Charles, I see an accident or we hear a squealing of brakes, we pray in other tongues. When we fly into a city for a heating explosion, we pray in tongues because there's power in that. When you don't know how to pray, pray in tongues. When you do know how to pray, pray in tongues because there's great power there. And then remember what he said. Remember that he said that if you drink any deadly thing, it's not going to hurt you. And he said, uh, you've got power over that devil. And it's time we began to quit worrying about the devil and to realize that we have more power than the devil has. And then the last 11 words, oh, these are so vital to this end time message that the Lord Jesus Christ is giving to the body of Christ. It's not new. He said it 2,000 years ago. But it's just as fresh today as it was 2,000 years ago when he said, Oh, my beloved believers, I want you to lay hands on the sick in my name. In my name, Jesus said, lay hands on the sick and you will see them recover. That's a promise that Jesus made. And Jesus cannot lie. There, is, there has never failed one word of all of the good promises of God. So when Jesus tells you that you will lay hands on the sick and they will recover, beloved, that's exactly what's going to happen. And that's what ha what's happening in these days. As we see the signs and the wonders going out, and we see the believers going out there and laying hands on the sick, as we get stacks of mail. When I got home from Guatemala, I had a stack of mail that high. And do you know what most of it was? It was letters from people saying to me, and then I laid hands on this one, and then I laid hands on that one, and then I laid hands on this one, and then I laid hands on that one, and they were healed. Uh, a, a very interesting letter that I got, I just received from a lady who came to our Dallas heating explosion. Because you know the exciting thing is we, well, sometimes those of us up on the stage never know what God does in an audience. But there was a gentleman there who was um, a real unbeliever, but he had come to please his wife because she was on a healing team. So he came down on the floor just to watch and see if what she said was true, you know, that she could really heal the sick. Well, she said, as long as you're here, why don't you get somebody to take care of your back? And he said, nah, that won't do any good. She said, come on, come on, come on. No, it won't do any good. No, it won't. Well, anyway, after much arguing and much discussion, he finally did decide to let one of the healing teams minister to his back. And, of course, you know the story before I finish. The man was totally healed by the power of God. But here's the interesting thing about it. Do you know what that woman wrote in the letter? She said, when I saw my husband healed, she said, my husband who doesn't believe in healing or anything else like that, she said, I was instantly delivered of cigarettes. She said, I've tried so hard to quit. And she said, I knew I wanted to because I knew I was in rebellion against God if I kept on smoking. But she said, I could never quit. But when I saw my husband healed, then I knew that God's power was for me too. And she said, I have not had a cigarette from then. Well, whatever your miracle, believe God for it right now in that name that's above every other name. Say it with me.